Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Pete Driscoll. Uh, it's my honour to be part of the PA programme uh, for Euclid, and, uh, which is all part of the Northwest programme. My remit is to give you a little bit of the history and the background to the programme and focus on what goes on at Euclid before they come to you for the first placement. I will allude to what then happens through the two-year program leading on to a second year placement. And at all stages, please pitch in with questions at any time you feel appropriate. I'm aware that you've all been extremely supportive to the PA program over the last year and you may well not have a question, but you may have a learning point which I think also would be very useful for your colleagues to pick up. Let's start right at the beginning and be clear about what a PA is and we'll break the first educational rule by starting off with the negative uh, but it is important, it's clear that the PA is not a doctor but it's a person who will be following the medical model under the supervision of a medical supervisor, I think that is important to register from the beginning, they are dependent practitioners, and they fit in a team to try and facilitate patient care. That's very nice, it's like mother's apple pie, let's just try and get down to some specifics. So this is what a PA nationally can do. Just take a few moments to, to read that and question things which need questioning. This point here I will allude to later on. There are in this very embryonic uh, job issues about legislation um, and it is now being delayed even further because of the recent election plans but we will talk about that shortly. Fine. What's the tagline if you wanted to actually say what can these people do? Well their focus is diagnosis and management. They are following the medical model, but in doing so, they remain under the supervision of people like yourselves. It could be, in practice, that that's at a distance. So we have PAs working in rural and remote areas under the supervision of a GP, so they do clinics at a distance. Mm. But that is a relationship built on trust, mm. on mutual respect, after several years following graduation, and they go off, and both partners in that relationship are aware of when the communication happens. But, even though it's at a distance, the doctor is in charge. To achieve this, we have clear guidance from the faculty of PA, and they have produced a curriculum and guidance on the programme, and they have generated two significant documents to help guide us. And that's available electronically, and Michael has copies of that for people if they wish to read it. Again, cutting to the chase, these documents list several hundred conditions which the PA is expected to know about by the time they finish their two-year program. An incredibly daunting issue. Now, the list is as not as comprehensive as uh, an undergraduate medical program, but I have to say the things which are listed we would readily accept as being the common, the important issues 
which any practitioner, be they a nurse, a doctor, or a PA, needs to be cognizant of. Because um, the, there's this focus on management and diagnosis, this medical model, what these documents have done is divided each of those conditions or categorized each of those conditions according to whether the PA can make a diagnosis after they've graduated on their own, on one, or whether they actually need assistance, a two. They also get categorized at the same time about whether they need assistance on management. So do they require no assistance in management? Uh, that'll be now with this or one B. Do they require assistance both in diagnosis and management with the two B. So it's very helpful for us in the sense of it gives us an idea of where the priorities are. But we, you, being at the front end, are well aware this is a very simplistic system. So if I give you an example of what is categorised as a 1A, coming from you guys, which would be pertinent, it would be asthma. That is considered a 1A condition, and you think well, that's very common, particularly in the UK, particularly in the North West. I can totally accept that these people need to be familiar with that condition. And uh, give me an example of a 2B, bipolar disorder would be considered a 2B. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd need help in making that diagnosis and you'd need help in managing that. But, let's have a reality check. You appreciate that you can't really categorise asthma into a 1A. Now my background, albeit it's now five years since I've been out of the research room, I am well aware, I've been with asthmatic cases where I have been royally supported by experts coming in and I was supposed to be working at a consultant level, but I needed expert paediatricians to come in, I needed expert asthma, um, anaesthetists, etc. to come in. So we have subtleties, we have nuances, we have to clearly define, well, what is a really a 1A condition? What is that grade of that condition which makes it independent, that you don't need input? And that decision or that change from this clear category to something which is a bit more fuzzy around the engines requires you. It makes, you know, I can't make that decision, I'm not a frontline clinician anymore. It requires you guys to say, no, no, we've moved on, we're using this drug, this therapy, etc. And so, even though we have these national documents, you will find, if you go from one program to the other, there are reasons why they are different. And it's because you guys who are spending a significant amount of time developing teams of which some of the PAs are in, will produce that nuance, that feel for what is important and how it should be managed. So that's reality. But let's get back to this, because it is very helpful. It gives us an idea, if you're designing a program, we really need to make sure we're covering 1As and 1Bs before we start getting onto the 2s. You know, that's help, very helpful for us. The guidance document also says where should that training be done and how much, how many hours minimum should be spent. We are talking just under 3,200 hours, um, which is a huge whack of time for a diploma course, more of that shortly. Just under half of it can be spent in university, but there is, right from the beginning, a desire to have most of the training, the majority of the training, with you guys at the coalface in the clinical environment. So the placements have a number of minimal hours associated with them. I'll just give you a few moments to look at that.
A number of these you will I'll come back to are being covered in the second year. The first year is really we're dealing with general hospital medicine. Mm -hmm. If you do your sums, you'll realise it doesn't actually add up to 1,600. We have about four, just slightly like less than 400, which is considered elective. And, and we need to be clear what does that mean. It means to direct the student to areas which they've either got to do more of, because they're not making the standard, or they actually have made the standard and they want to become better at it, mm -hmm. rather than... Uh, the medical elective model, which is you go to the third world, etc. That is that is not an option, certainly not in the Northwest program at the moment. These hours, what does that mean in real life? It means that we're ramming a three-year master's program into two years, and for this, this is teaching hours. You really have to add at least two more thousand hours of personal work. So right from the beginning, and this is something which uh, the North West has got hold of, and, and certainly is appreciated of, is your selection. You, you, you will have bright people, but it's whether they can give that commitment for two years is an issue. Because remember, we are dealing with mature graduates, they are invariably married, long-term relationships, kids, mortgages, etc., etc., and even though they may have the right attributes, mentally, physically, etc., uh, can they lock themselves away for those two years? And possibly we can chat about that, because that's something which I personally have learned a lot more about in this last year. It's prior to coming here, I was dealing with undergraduates, where this was not an issue. Mm. But this is an issue which we have to respect. So, the yin and yang of what we've got, you know, you get more mature people, highly motivated, but they have other life responsibilities. Um, once they finish the two year program, that is not the end of their training. Um, there's a commitment both nationally and in the Northwest is that they do a probation, ideally a year. And uh, the Northwest is generalist, generous, um, has with great magnanimity um, given um, uh, funding for six months and that is then equaled by the, the GP hospitals etc so they are in probation for that year and they go through under a supervised practice building of their portfolio um, they have to like you guys and also nurses have a certain commitment on CPD and different and I, I, I'm bound to be corrected on this, but certainly different from medicine, maybe it's different from nursing, they have to do their national exam every six years. Mm. So even if they qualify and then they say, right, I really enjoyed your, your session, I'm going to go off and work with you in acute mm. medicine, every six years mm. they will have to do this general exam. So probably good for you, they're doing paediatrics, they have to do this general exam which will include a lot of uh, adult and also surgery and things like that. And that, I think, is unique. So from the hospital, from the GP perspective, it's great. So you have this generalist who can act as medical polyfiller and go in as your work commitment to change. Um, but we have a reality check, it's still embryonic. So rather than having the GMC, which they are registered with, or the equivalent nursing organization, we have a voluntary register, which carries out that role, and the, the PAs are uh, strongly encouraged to be part of that, and to become part of it, they have to pass the national exam. But there's no formal legal requirement. And because of that, at the moment, they do not have the right in law to prescribe or request ionizing radiation. There are aspirations nationally to change that, but that is in the hands of the politician. Okay, 
That was the background. How has that been uh, changed into the Northwest program? Well, the Northwest program, uh, royally led and supported by Judith in the uh, what was known as the deanery, got a group of HEIs, uh, universities, three, uh, and put together what they felt was the way forward. So it's it's a Henway. Health Education England Northwest driven program. They're wanting to achieve these national recommendations, but also produce PAs, practitioners who have these skills. The other thing is, uh, and again, it's a tribute to these clever people. I certainly wasn't involved in it. I came in slightly late, but they decided, right, we're going to develop this course. And we can see how it, it, it's working elsewhere. And indeed, uh, though it's been going in the UK for 11 years now, 11, 12 years, it's been going in the United States where it originated for about six to six years. And it started there really because in rural and remote areas, they couldn't get doctors and or nurses to fill the roles. So a great guy had the brainwave, he says, well, what about these people who are graduates, who've done BMED science type courses, um, who are no longer, who aren't working in the health service, can't we rope them in, do some sort of training and get them up to some sort of level to help out? So that was a concept which is obviously mushroomed royally in, in America and came over to Birmingham about 11, 12 years ago, led by founding father in this country, a guy called Prof. Jim Paul, who's a, a GP. So there are very, various models out there. The clever people from uh, Manchester, Liverpool, and Henway, and, and Euclid got together, and they thought, right, OK, how are we going to put this program together? How are we going to achieve these competencies? And so they looked at the first year, and they put this timetable together. So just to orientate you, these are the months. These are obviously uh, the various days of the week in the month. And you'll see it's colour-coded, and green um, is there at university. Um, I have no idea how that comes out on your video, but if this sort of pinky colour here <laughs> is the um, uh, out in clinical placement. These are holidays. Um, and you will see there's a sandwich they are going uh, university into placements, university, etc. So it is modular. Now the significance of this, this is not common. If you go to the United States, the first year is more or less entirely university based. And then the second year is more or less entirely um, hospital based. Okay, uh, self-evidently it works. Um, so uh, we have a modular system, and I have to say, after a year, and that's all I've got to compare it with, it, it worked. Um, I've talked to people in London where they do have this hermetically sealed system, and, and it works there as well. So horses to horses. Into this second year, again, we have the, the months here and the days of the month. We banned it, and this is where your good self was involved, because in stage two, if we look upon year one as stage one, year one as stage one, year three, and then we have stage two, and um, this is where they go out in their specialities, paediatrics, female health, mental health, surgical specialities, so you were in there, all right? So again, within that stage, we have a period of time at university to prep them for what they're going to face and then they go out and they have the clinical placement. Stage three, again, modular. This is focusing, and it's coming on to your good self here, acute front door medicine. Key concept here is untriaged people. We don't know what their underlying condition is. We have to really work on our diagnostic skills, etc. And then we have this phase here where they come back to the university and they do their finals round about these stages here but also then move on and preparation for the national exam 
And I'm going to focus from what they do generally in the Northwest and the guidance which we all um, comply with and move on to what happens at Euclid. And this is where the invite is again expressed, getting your involvement. I have absolutely no idea whether this is the right way. It seems sensible, and it still seems sensible, but that is not high science. So it requires experience of what is working, what's not working, so we feed it into the system so next year and subsequent years we continue to improve. The basics is as follows. We have in the first year four modules which we focus on and they are listed there. The first one is application, I know it says something different there, but the bottom line, what it's saying is apply basic sciences to the clinical situation. So that's anatomy, physiology, microbiology, immunology, etc. And taking the elements of those huge disciplines and applying them to clinical practice, focusing on those hundred or so several hundred conditions we've listed in the curriculum. This module is focusing on their diagnostic skills. What tests would they do? How do they interpret those results? And then feed it back into their clinical skills, which they've got from either history or uh, examination. This is where my learned colleague Jane comes in and we're talking about therapeutics and prescribing. So even though they don't have that legal right, they will be involved in drugs every single day. And we've anticipated they will have those uh, legal uh, rights in the future. And then we have you guys coming along and taking them and making them the PAs they should be. So you remember we have this modular system. We do the training at the university in preparation before the clinical practice. And though most of the university blocks are three, four weeks, that type of phase, the first one is 16. So we're taking these people from their initial degrees and getting them to some form where they can function, in most cases, in clinical practice for the first time. Just probably worth giving you some figures. 85% are coming from a BMed science background nationally. 15% are moving sideways from the NHS. So pharmacy, nursing, radiotherapy, radiology, uh, psychology are some of the topics mm -hmm. we Okay, complicated slide, what we're showing here. Well, we've got the weeks, and it goes on after Easter, for the 16 weeks. And on the top here are those topics which need to be covered. Now, you, some of them you, you need to resonate with anatomy, physiology, etc. We've got therapeutics and prescribing diagnostic aspects of history taking etc and moving through to other aspects of professionalism so all the elements we feel are key are listed there and then what we aim to do is on a weekly logical process we go through the systems of the body so we start with the core because everything is then built on that, so we'll start off with respiratory, the cardiovascular, and we move on to the abdominal system. We achieve, hopefully, that by Easter, and then move on into skeletal, uh, peripheral nervous system, etc., after Easter for the 16 weeks. And then we touch a little bit on the CNS, but we'll come back to the CNS in uh, August, as we build on in hopefully spiral fashion. And obviously you'll have copies of the slides and you'll be able to read this in a bit clearer, etc. So again, there may be aspects of this which you feel are right or need to be added on. Do you just let me know and I'm more than happy to change them. 
A um, little bit now about how we teach. Again, I, I have long conversations with my learned colleague about how little evidence we've got about the science behind our teaching. But I feel it's important that we share this with you because, again, it's open for uh, debate. We have to recognise we're not dealing with novice learners. We're dealing with people who already have achieved good things. They're all graduates. Uh, and those graduates' topics are in relevant areas which we need to respect. We also have at Euclid a state-of-the-art library, which, okay, that's good. And self-evidently in these 16 weeks, we will give them lectures, and you would accept that that is a lecture. The classic format for the lecture in the first 16 weeks is rare. At Euclid, we try and break everything down into groups. So every single teaching session is interactive. Uh, there's prep work, etc. And often in each of the teaching sessions, there's more than one teacher. It facilitates the interaction. So there are lectures. The big workhorse, though, of the way we get the knowledge through is workshops. Again, breaking them down into even smaller groups and these are guys working through elements of diagnosis and data interpretation. So they're having to apply knowledge, look at uh, investigations and see how that's changing their management. And again, linking it back into the 16-week uh, structure which you saw, try, we're trying, sometimes it doesn't work, but we're trying to develop this spiral process where they go in, learn, move on to the next thing, utilizing the knowledge which they've acquired. The other thing which I want to register why we want this to happen, rather than simply giving them a PBL type structure, is we have to see how the team is working. And we can get some of that information from PBL, which I'll talk about, but this gives us another aspect of how they are supporting one another in the reality, in the quick situation. How are we managing to cover everything? Well, because we feel empowered to strip things down. One of my particular uh, loves is anatomy and I, I had the opportunity to teach anatomy several times through my life, but I'm aware that the PA's need for certain anatomical knowledge is key, and the knowledge for other anatomy is not that essential. So everything, be it anatomy, be it physiology, be it microbiology, has to have a clinical application. And everything is taught and immediately followed with the clinical application. There isn't Oh, I'm going to teach you this, and in six weeks' time, we'll get back to why you need it. No, no. Everything closes that loop. So, this is after Easter, and as I said, this is how it all builds up, and we go through the rest of the systems. But also, what I wanted to register is that there's a huge risk with anatomy, physiology, therapeutics, etc., that we've got really, you know, great teachers, but they'll all do it slightly differently. They'll all go slightly off piece. So running down the program is a spine. And that spine is a 1A condition, different every single week, which focuses the anatomy, physiology, etc., on that condition. So obviously, before Easter, a 1A condition would be asthma. So they would look at the anatomy, the physiology, da -de -da -de -da, related to asthma. Mm. So it helps the teachers to have an idea and appreciation of what needs to be covered and what ultimately doesn't need to be covered. Mm. So these weekly cases aren't just simply PBL. Um, they're very focused on clinical topics, the you know, same structure but also it, there's a strong encouragement that they go off, they work, they work in groups or they work individually and then they come back. 
That is the first 16 weeks. I just also have to tell you that we change the format as the year goes on because of the environments they're working in. So when they go out into hospital or clinical placements, what we then do is change it so they can work on it individually. So the actual structure is um, more directed in the questions rather than more uh, experimental uh, where they can actually uh, think out what type of questions need to be asked. When they're clinical placement, working independently, very focused. The other thing which we do when they come back in August is we change this scenario, the case, it's always case based, into a real life event. So we run it as a scenario. So they're having to work through the patient in real life, working as a team. And again, after they've been in clinical practice at least once, they are appreciative of different roles, etc. So it gives us another feel for how teams are coming together. That's how a weekly timetable will end up looking. So again, just take an opportunity to look at it. SDL is self-directed learning. And our aspiration is to integrate it. That everything is helping the other part of the program, whether it be it the anatomy helping the clinical examination, physiology helping you know, data interpretation, etc. And leading through there is obviously things like communication and professionalism again to enable you to get information in a constructive way and also know what your role is. So again, to give you an example, if I'm going to teach you anatomy of the knee, it has to have an immediate application. One of the things which we really are keen on is surface anatomy, because that, that and imaging is where they're going to be working. They're not going to be in the operating room by and large. They're going to be feeling, touching, etc. And so the anatomy of the knee is taught in a clinical environment. We integrate it. So the lectures or the workshops, etc., will start off with a case. So in this particular case, we have a person who uh, has got a particular abdominal pain in a particular area. They will take that and then go to the anatomy. Mm -hmm. All right. So they then learn that if you have a pain in this area, you have a particular condition in the hind gut. And then from that knowledge, you then go on to the next case where you're dealing with the hinder and you now have imaging. And then you go back on and look at a practical procedure. So the idea is even in the 16 weeks is to try and integrate it and get a spiral going. So they all help one another. The other thing which I need to register is that though a lot come from the BMED science, one of the elephant traps I fell into was assuming that BMED science was all the same in the UK. It's hugely different. So we will have BMED science graduates who've done no anatomy and have done a lot of genetics in their BMED science and you know variations of that. See, we do have a heterogeneous group. The advantage we found is that Everybody is having a good part in the program and everybody is having a bad part in the program and it sort of evens itself out so you don't have too much loss of, uh, loss of confidence. Again, we build up. So we start with anatomy, then it integrates it into urine analysis, then they're going to use these skills when they're actually uh, taking a history and uh, examining uh, one of their colleagues and then they go on to... Um, volunteer patients at Euclid before they physically come to you. Mm. So there is some sort of induction into the process but self-evidently taking them from this to being competent on the wards in general practice requires huge amounts of your time and expertise. Helping them in the process and also psychologically adjust, we get experts in. And in the first year, it's primarily PAs, card-carrying professional PAs working in various parts of the UK, coming in and teaching them how 
they went through the program, what they've learned, how they've discovered what's important, etc. We do have clinical ex experts coming in as well, but this has been very successful. Mm -hmm. We get them to some, hopefully, some levels of competencies, and then Jane has put together this document, which they then go out with, and she will be alluding to this later on. And so I will not steal her thunder. But there are a list of things they need to do when they're on placement. We would like to ensure that's a bit like a relay race. The baton is then handed on to you experts, and you are aware. And you, this this learning process can be facilitated. In second year, this is your good self, so we're coming. We have the equivalent of those documents pertinent to each of the speciality. So it breaks down the timetable, the learning objectives, etc. And obviously we have to assess and each of the module has a, a, a formal way it is assessed, a formal pass mark. It involves obviously uh, written exams, MCQs, short answer questions, uh, OSCEs, and portfolios. This is part of the work which they're doing in the clinical placement. So we just pull and sort of summarise it. Um, well, in the next week or so, they will be doing a formative exam here. It's the end of the first 16 week programme, and that will give them uh, an insight into what we are asking for them to achieve in their summative exam in October. And this area, extremely important, it's your feedback, how it's going, etc., will also have a crucial role. Professionalism comes in several times. You, your feel for professionalism, but also in all the OSCE stations there is a professionalism element, so it runs almost horizontally through the OSCE uh, stations. Second year, a similar system. And again, the professionalism, clinical competence is there. And at this stage, this is their graduate exam for the university, but that does not allow them to be a practicing PA. They have to pass the national exam. How are we doing? Well, this is their performance last year. This is the formative uh, MCQ and the formative OSCE results and this is their performance in October. And they all did better. Well, you know, we, you would hope that was the case, um, but it was nice to see that they had got better. And um, so we feel that we're moving in the right direction. It could be more efficient, I'm sure. Uh, you know, we could be doing things differently, we should make it even better, but we're sort of moving there. What we do need is clinical input to make sure that if we're moving in the right direction, we continue to be moving in the right direction. What we're teaching is pertinent, it is still current, etc. And that your appreciation, your perspective of their professionalism or not, is being fed back into the system. And these are the guys uh, doing their OSCE exam last October. That's the quietest I've ever seen them. Um, so, bottom line is, desperately need input from you guys, and that could be on an individual basis, or it could be on the programme itself, and we need to improve it. This is the big thing which I'd like to get through to you, is feel and power. This is still very much a pilot programme, and it will only improve if we get feedback from all the participants.